Okay, so uh, <coughs> let's uh, uh, get started. So last time, we, uh, I, I mentioned we'd do this one demo uh, once I got it organized, because I, I only came back on the, the Tuesday and didn't have time to organize it for the Wednesday lecture. And this was the last bit of uh, rotating bodies, and it's to do with the, the gyroscope. So <coughs> what we have uh, with a gyroscope so really all you need to take away from this is the qualitative uh, knowledge, right? We're not actually going to do calculations with gyroscopes, uh, but you do need to be able to sort of figure out which way a gyroscope would process and why a gyroscope processes. Um, so a gyroscope, of course, is a wheel that you spin around. Usually it's a wheel with a, a pretty large moment of inertia, and you spin it round with an angular velocity and you've now got an angular velocity around here. You've got a moment of inertia, and so you know that you've got an angular momentum, right? Because angular momentum is moment of inertia multiplied by angular velocity. And if you have a gyroscope like this and you support it at one end, you have a large angular momentum along the axis of rotation of the gyroscope, right? However, of course, the center of mass of the gyroscope is here in the center, and so its weight acts down vertically down here, and you have a normal force acting vertically up on the gyroscope here, and so what you've got, if you've got a force up there and a force down there, is you've got a moment that's trying to make the gyroscope uh, rotate. So <clears throat> if we've got the gyroscope here, if it's spinning around, I've got a large angular momentum this way, but the weight of the gyroscope acts down in the middle, and if I'm holding it up here with this rope, then there's also a moment that's going to want to make it rotate, and I can show you this without the gyroscope spinning. If I let go of this, it swings down, right? It rotates this way, right? So <clears throat> that moment comes from the weight of the gyroscope and the, well, in that case, normal force, in this case, tension in the string. Right? So <clears throat> what that will do, we've seen that if you've, got a, uh, if you've got a moment acting, that generates a change in the angular momentum. So if we've got a rotation like this, it will generate, if you use our right hand, we're curving, we're rotating in that direction, so it will generate an angular momentum pointing into the wall. So if I have an angular momentum from the rotating disk that's pointing that way, and then I have an angular momentum that's a change in angular momentum that's pointing into the wall, it will make the disk want to move towards the wall, right? And so what will happen is the gyroscope, the axis of the gyroscope, will move in this direction. Now, when it's here, of course, the moment between the weight and the tension here is now acting this way, so it's going to make the angular momentum change in this direction, so it's going to keep... Uh, rotating, and what you'll end up with is the axis of the gyroscope will rotate around like that, and this is called precession of the gyroscope. So, <coughs> if I can get this to work right, uh, I want it to, so if I want an angular momentum vector in that direction, then I need to spin it this way. And then if I hold it here, you can see that it processes round in this direction, right? And that's due to the moment between the tension here and the weight on the gyroscope changing the angular momentum vector, right? And just to show you that it really does work, if I spin it the other way, right, then the angular momentum vector will be this way. The change in the angular momentum will still be that way. So to make, so this will cause it to rotate like this, because I'm changing it, it starts pointing this way, I need it to have a component towards the back wall, and if it's, it's the only way that can happen is if it rotates like this, right? So if I spin it the other way, it should process in the other direction, like that, right? So this is just due to adding <coughs> to the moment between the tension and the weight here, changing the angular momentum vector of the gyroscope. And that's why gyroscopes can sort of stay up like they do. I'll do it one more time the other way. All 
Like that, that's why the axis remains almost horizontal. Right? And so this is due to adding angular momentum um, vectors together. And angular momentum adds even if it's not about the same axis. Right? There's only one angular momentum for an object, and it's the sum total of all the uh, causes of angular momentum. It doesn't necessarily have to point along the axis of rotation. OK. <clears throat> so here's a question for you guys. If I have a gyroscope that looks like this, it pivots about here. So this is its support. The top of the gyroscope, so this is a picture of the top of the gyroscope, is rotating this way. What direction will this end move in? Right? So it's viewed from above, top of the gyroscope rotating this way, gravity acting down and into the page. Right? Which direction will this gyroscope process? Uh, start, there you go. Oh, OK, all over the place. Right, turn to your neighbor and try and convince them that you've got the right answer. Yeah. OK, so let's uh, vote again, see if anybody's changed their mind. Stop at 30. OK. Wow. OK. Still. <coughs> OK, so this, this isn't working. So we'll, uh, we'll go through it. OK, so what we've got here right, is, oops, if I clear that, what we've got here is our gyroscope that the top of it's rotating this way. And here's our axle. right, And here's our pivot point. OK, so if we look, the first thing we want to know is we want to know what is the angular, what is the direction of the angular momentum of the gyroscope? Well, if we take my right hand and I curl it over the top like this, so it's pointing over the top, then your thumb should point towards, uh, should point towards the pivot, right? So the angular momentum vector of the gyroscope is pointing like that, right? And you get that from the right hand rule. Now, if I look at the forces acting on this, I have a normal force that's acting up and out of the plane of the paper here. So this is my normal force here. And I have a weight that's acting down in the middle of the uh, rotating disk here. So this side is trying to move up. That part is trying to move down. So if I use the right hand rule there, I curve my, uh, curve my fingers like that. So it's coming up at the pivot point, down where the disk is. And so my change in angular momentum, remember, because this is a moment, and moment uh, uh, acting for a small period of time gives you a change in angular momentum. So the change in angular momentum here is acting down. Right? Everybody happy with that? Yep. You put your fingers down where the weight goes and up where the normal force is, right? And you should, and with your right hand, and your thumb should be pointing down. So if I add those two together, the new angular momentum vector is going to be pointing in this direction, which means that this end here has to move up, right? Because the angular momentum vector points along the axis of the gyroscope. And so if, my, if it changes this way, the new angular momentum vector will look like that. And the only way I can get that is if the end of this moves up the page. So the answer was A, up the screen. 
right? So this end here will move up like that. Everybody happy with that? All right? So <coughs> first thing is decide the direction of the angular momentum vector. Second thing is look at the direction of the moment vector, and that gives you the direction of the change in angular momentum. And then when you add these two together on a vector diagram, this, the, the resultant of those two, gives you the direction of the new angular momentum vector, which is the axle, which is along the axis of rotation of the gyroscope. Yeah? Pardon? Because the angular momentum vector is along, the angular momentum vector is this direction right, along the axis. So if I need my angular momentum vector to point in this direction, right, I have to move this end up. If I move this end down, the angular momentum vector is pointing this way. Yeah? Everybody happy with that? No? Well, I can do it and I can show you it, right? So, <coughs> so here we go. Uh, Okay, we'll hold it this way around so I match exactly the, uh, the, the thing here. So on the top, uh, I've got it going this way. So I'll rotate the top this way, and then up the screen will be towards the wall, and down the screen will be towards you guys. So uh, I better get this right. <laughs> there we go, right? It moved towards the wall. Right? So it processes the end of the gyroscope moves in that direction. Okay. <coughs> are, are people still unhappy with it? Right, all you have to do is figure out direction of the angular momentum vector to start with, direction of the moment vector, which gives you the change in angular momentum vector, and then you add those two together by drawing a little vector triangle like this, and then the direction of this new angular momentum vector will tell you what direction the axle uh, points in. So at the end of last lecture, we had this uh, ladder problem. <laughs> Here, and... Well, I got the diagram here. Um, so we had this ladder problem, and we were wanting to calculate what the minimum angle theta is for the ladder not to fall flat. And the two conditions that we had on this were that we had this new condition for equilibrium that the sum of the moments about any point also had to add to give zero. Otherwise, we were going to end up with an angular acceleration, and then, of course, that would be the ladder rotating and, and, and falling flat. So <coughs> we used the condition that the sum of the forces have to be zero, and we can use that in x and in y, two perpendicular directions. And then we have this additional condition here that the sum of the moments also have to be zero, and we ended up with this equation here. So... I will transpose those equations uh, onto this sheet. So we have uh, Rw equals Fg, and that was our equation one. And that came from, I'll put this down here. So this came from Newton's second law, taking this direction as positive. We ended up with this force has to be equal to the friction force on the ground. Um, so that was our first equation. The second equation, came from resolving them vertically, where we had Rg was equal to uh, the weight of the ladder plus the weight of the man, and that was our equation two. Um, <coughs> then from friction, because we're in the limiting case of friction, we have Fg is equal to mu times Rg, and that comes about here, relationship between the normal force and the friction force in the limiting case. And then finally, we had from our, our moments, uh, we had, and I'll write out the one, so 1.5 WL cos theta plus 2.5 WM 
cos theta is equal to 3 rw sine theta. And that was our fourth equation, right? And that came, and that came from taking moments about this point here, and we had wl cos theta times this distance, wm cos theta times this distance, which was 2.5, and then minus, because it was in the opposite direction to uh, clockwise, we had rw, in this case, sine theta, uh, times the full length of the ladder, which was 3. Right, and those all had to add together to give zero. So, <coughs> what we want to do now is we want to uh, uh, solve this to find out uh, uh, the, the value of theta, because we remember we've, we've assumed that we're in the limiting case of friction, so we want to solve these equations here for the value of theta. And so what we want to get rid of from this equation here is we want to get rid of this Rw, because we don't know uh, what Rw is, right? It's the reaction force on the wall, but we don't know what its value is. So uh, if we look at this, we can say that Rw is equal to Fg. So what we can do is we can combine 1 and 3. We're not actually adding them. We're just combining them. And we say that Rw is equal to mu times Rg, right? And that's combining these two equations here. Rw is equal to Fg, and so therefore Rw is equal to mu times Rg. <coughs> now Rg is equal to this from equation 2. So now we use equation 2, and we have that Rw is equal to mu times Wl plus Wm. Right? Now, WL and WM are quantities that we know because we know the mass of the, uh, uh, we know the weight of the ladder and we know the weight of the man. Um, so if I can, uh, RG here, oops. So RG is equal to three, 980 uh, newtons, right? So this quantity here is 980 newtons. Right? I think it's 20 kilo, I think we had 20 kilograms for the ladder and uh, 10 kilograms, uh, 20, uh, 20 kilograms for the ladder and 80 kilograms for the man. So that's 100 kilograms multiplied by 9.8. So that's 980 newtons here. So Rw is equal to this, we were told, was 3.5, right? We were told the coefficient of friction uh, between the ladder and the ground. And so now we know that Rw is 3.5 times. 980, and that is equal to 3,430 newtons, right? So <coughs> we now know the value of Rw. So if we look at this equation here, we know all the quantities that are in it, right? We now know everything except for theta, so we can just put everything in here and uh, solve for theta. So what we have is 1.5 times, and then the weight of the ladder was 20 uh, times 9.8. Uh, we'll just put W. Uh, do I actually have, yeah, so 80. I don't have that figured out. Um, anybody got a calculator? They can just do uh, 80 times 9, uh, sorry, uh, what are we, WL. So 20 times 9.8 should be 980, yeah, 196. right, um, cos theta plus 2.5 times, and then, uh, well, we know the total is, is so 80 times 9.8. Anybody got a calculator? 784. 784, thanks. Right, uh, cos theta, and that's going to be equal to 3 times 3430 sine theta, right? So <coughs> if we add these together, and I'll cheat and use my already calculated number here, uh, we get 2,254 uh, cos theta. And this is going to be equal to 10,290 sine theta. 
So divide through by cos theta and divide the 10,000 over here. And what I end up with is tan theta is equal to 2254 divided by 10,290. And then I can just take the uh, uh, inverse tangent uh, of that. And that gives me that theta is equal to 12.35 degrees, right? So we started with these four simultaneous equations that we got from Newton's law in X, Newton's law in Y, and the sum of the moments of the, new, um, the rotational form of Newton's law. So we knew that some of the moments were zero. We added in our condition for limiting friction, and that gave us all the quantities we needed to be able to solve what the minimum uh, uh, lean of the ladder was, right? So in this case, it's pretty extreme uh, at 12.35 degrees. So any questions about that? Yeah. No, no, I divided through by cos theta. So I took the cos theta, so I took the cos theta over here, and I took this quantity over here. And sine theta divided by cos theta is tan theta. Right, and then this, you get this 2,000 over 10,000. <coughs> I mean, once you've got these equations down, right, the rest of it is just maths, right? So the physics input all goes into getting these equations right, and then after that, you're just solving simultaneous equations. Okay, so any questions with that? Good, Th this is about the hardest type of uh, mechanics problem that you will have to deal with, right? These sort of complex equilibrium problems. I don't think anything gets, uh, gets much harder than that. They're not always ladder questions, though. OK. <coughs> so the next concept I want to introduce is something called the center of gravity. And this was actually something we touched on in the, in the last lecture. So we've already had our definition of center of mass. And we said that the position vector of the center of mass was equal to the sum over all the particles that made up the system of the mass of those particles times their position vectors divided by the sum of all the masses, right? And that was our way of sort of getting the average position of all the mass in a system, and we said that the position vector of that average, the average location of the mass, was what we called the center of mass. Now, <clears throat> supposing we want to calculate the average position of the weight, right? So if we have an object, uh, we want to know where does the weight of that object act. And so what we want to have for this is we don't want the center of mass, we want what's called the center of gravity, right? So it's the position of the average weight, right? It's the position where the weight acts. So if you look here, when we were calculating the position of the average mass, we summed over the masses times the position vectors. What we want to do for the average position of the weight, which is what we call the center of gravity, is we sum over the weights, multiply, or the magnitude of the weights, multiplied by the position vector where that, that, that acts, right? So for the center of gravity, we have a slightly different formula. Uh, oops. Right? So in this case, we sum over the, excuse me, sorry, I got a bit of a cold keep wanting to sneeze. Um, we have a, a, we sum over the weights of each particle that makes up the system multiplied by its position vector. This is the magnitude of the weight. And <coughs> we then divide by the total weight. Now, if we have a constant gravitational field, Right, so that the entire object is in the same gravitational field, then the weight here is just equal to the mass times the gravitational field. Right? So what we can do is we can replace it for a constant gravitational field. The position vector of the center of gravity 
is just equal to mi g r i divided by well, since g is constant, I can take it out of this sum because every term in that sum is multiplied by g. And this becomes g sum over miri divided by g over the sum of mi. So the g's cancel. And this, of course, is just the center of mass. So if the gravitational field is constant, the position vector of the center of gravity is equal to the position vector of the center of mass, but only when there is a constant gravitational field. If the object's so large that the gravitational field varies over the uh, range of the object, then this no longer applies, right? So for example, if you take the Earth, uh, clearly the gravitational field of the Earth varies from the core out to the surface, and so in that case, you can't use, this, uh, uh, you can't use uh, this simple derivation here to say that the center of gravity is equal to the center of mass. Uh, as it turns out, for the Earth, because it's a spherically symmetric body, the two are actually the same, uh, but they're the same because of the spherical symmetry. Right? If you had something like an asteroid that's got a sort of a, you know, a blate spheroid type shape or large craters or something like that, then its center of mass is not actually necessarily going to be its center of gravity. Right? So you can have a center of gravity that is not at the same position as the center of mass if you have a varying gravitational field. Another example would be, say, uh, if you had a rod near a black hole, uh, the center of gravity of the rod would not necessarily be the, uh, the center of mass of the rod because the bit of the rod near the black hole would feel a huge, uh, a far larger gravitational field, and the part of the rod further away from the black hole would feel less of a gravitational field, so the center of gravity of the rod would actually be closer to the black hole than the center of the rod, right? Because the gravitational field varies over the length of the rod. So for most cases you are going to be dealing with, in fact, almost all cases you will deal with, uh, this will be the case that you've got a constant gravitational field and the center of mass is equal to the center of gravity, but it's not, not guaranteed. Right? <coughs> okay, so <coughs> supposing now we have a rigid body that's resting on the ground. Right? So we'll take the simplest thing we can, we can think of and uh, just take a rod like this and we'll put a support here and a support here. Right? Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be a uniform rod, so I don't have to put the, uh, you know, if it is a uniform rod, then the center of gravity here would of course be in the middle, but the center of gravity will have to lie somewhere along this rod. Right? So, Let's say we put it there. Now, if I take another example here and I've moved one of the supports, now each of these supports generates a normal force. Oops. And so what we can do is we can look at the uh, 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 equilibrium conditions. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. So if we look at these uh, equilibrium conditions for here, clearly if we resolve the forces, it's quite easy to imagine that the sum of these two normal forces is equal to the weight. Right? And it's the same in this case, the sum of the two normal forces can equal to the weight. So in terms of resolving the forces, not a problem. Right? These both can be in equilibrium, and there's no problem with that. But if we now look at the moments, right, then <coughs> what we have here, and all I'm going to do is forget the magnitudes of the moments, I'm just going to write down the directions of the moments, and we can take the moments about the center of gravity, right? Because if we take the moments about the center of gravity, the weight has no moment, right? So <clears throat> if I take the moments about the center of gravity here, then this one is going to have a clockwise moment. So what I end up with is a clockwise moment. 
And then this one here is going to make it rotate in the opposite direction, so it's a counterclockwise moment. So I have a, oops, uh, yeah, is that right? Uh, no, yeah, there we go. Right, so I've got one, one clockwise, one counterclockwise, right? So it is possible, if the forces of these are the right magnitudes, it's possible for this to equal zero, right? So at least possible. But if I look at this, and I'm taking moments about this point, then this force has a moment that looks like this. And this force also has a moment that looks like this. So if I add those together, they can never be equal to zero. And so therefore, this system cannot be in equilibrium. Right? It's impossible for this system to be in equilibrium because if I sum the moments together, these two forces <coughs> will always have a net moment about the center of gravity, and so therefore the object will start to rotate. And these two forces cannot be zero because if they're zero, then I've got a net force acting on it, and so the object's falling, right? So I cannot have this, this system cannot be in equilibrium. And so what we end up with, although I've shown you here for a sort of a, a, an idealized case, in general, what you can show is that if the center of gravity does not lie over the supports of the object, then it is impossible to have the system in equilibrium. And so we have a condition for an object to be uh, uh, balanced if it's, in a con if it's in a gravitational field. Its center of gravity must lie between or over its area of contact with the ground. And if it doesn't, it's not in equilibrium. It will end up rotating and falling over, right? So that's a condition for balance. Center of gravity must lie over the points of contact with the ground, right? So that's why you can't sort of lean over at a large angle because your center of gravity will move from being over your feet and then you'll fall over, right? So it applies to any object. The center of mass of the, uh, of the object must lie um, over its supports in order to, uh, for it to be in equilibrium. <coughs> so this leads to problems that math ma mathematicians love to deal with, uh, stacking problems, but we'll, we'll deal with a simple one. So is it possible to create a stack of identical frictionless books such that the book on the top of the stack does not overlap the book on the bottom of the stack, and you're not allowed to use glue, nor are you allowed to have such a high stack that the top book is in free fall because it's out of the Earth's gravitational field, right? So no orbiting books. I, I put that in because one guy came up with that. Um, <coughs> so no orbiting books, no glue allowed. Can you make a stack such that the top book does not lie over the bottom book? There we go. Wow, okay, a pretty even split between the two. Okay, so turn to your neighbor and try and convince them that you've got the right answer. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's vote again and see if anybody's changed their mind. Wow, okay, so we still have no, we still have a, almost no change. Okay, so I will, I will have to tell the answer. This is a bit of a, this is more of a, of a fun puzzle than, uh, than anything else. So, if I, Take my, my bottom book here, right? So that's my fixed book. Now, if I put this book just slightly over the edge here, right, that's clearly going to be in equilibrium, right? Because its center of gravity is going to be somewhere like here. If I put the next book on top of it, slightly further over, then its center of gravity is going to be here. This guy, uh, so this one's supported because it's still above the book beneath it. So this book by itself is in equilibrium. But if I combine the center of gravity of this guy and this guy, the net center of gravity of these two books is over here, right? <coughs> now, if I keep adding books on like this, Right, then here, again, this guy's center of gravity is somewhere over here. And now my center of gravity is moving to sort of the average of these three, so it may be moving to sort of here. 
Um, but this one is almost entirely not over the bottom book. And so, you know, I, I'm not saying that I've done this accurately, but you know, if you add a third one, you can imagine that as you add the books together, because the book that you add here has only a small effect on the center of gravity, because now this one has got a book of mass one, uh, one weight, but there are three weights here which pull it over to this side. So you have to look at the center of gravity of the top book to make sure that the top book is in equilibrium. But then, you know, if you want to know whether the top two books are in equilibrium, you have to look at the center of gravity of the top two books relative to their support, and then at the top three books relative to their support, and so on. And so it is indeed possible to create a stack of books such that the top book does in no way uh, uh, overlap the book on the bottom. But you've obviously, it, it's, you can't just do that with one book. Uh, you've got to have a whole stack of books, and then you curve them carefully so that the center of gravity of each you know, set of books as you keep on going down is always over the book beneath it, right? And so you end up with a sort of a, a funny sort of shape that curves over uh, at the top if you do it one on top of the other like that. So it is possible. If you don't believe me, go home. I'm sure you've got lots of textbooks at home, and, uh, and you can create a stack and, uh, and, and show that it's possible. <coughs> but, so now, now I'll leave you with a, with a fun question, and we'll come back to this next lecture uh, once you've had a, because physics is an experimental science, so I'll, I'll let you experiment with this. Question is, how many is the minimum number of books needed to create a stack such that one of the books on top does not overlap the book on the bottom? Right? So what's the minimum number? Right? So I'll leave you that as a puzzle. You can go home and play with that over the weekend, and I'll tell you the answer on, uh, on and show you the answer on, uh, on Monday. <coughs> OK, so just time for one last problem to do with center of gravity. And this is going to address why do motorbike riders lean as they go into a corner, right? So if you've ever seen motorcycle racing as they go into a corner, even when you're riding your bike, as you go around a corner, you lean into it slightly. Uh, so why do we do this? Well, let's take an example of an 80 kilogram man traveling on a 200 kilogram motorbike, uh, traveling at a speed of 60 kilometers an hour, round a bend with a radius of 30 meters. What angle does the rider have to lean at in order to uh, uh, not fall over? So <clears throat> here's our picture. So we've got our motorbike rider here. We've got the center of gravity of the man and the bike uh, together acting at some distance away from the uh, point of contact. And so you can see that this force acts uh, uh, downwards here. And then at the point of contact here, we've got a friction force and we've got a normal force. And <clears throat> this is why the motorbike rider has to lean into the bend. Because if the bike rider does not lean into the bend, you're going to have a friction force acting at the bottom of the bike here. And there will be nothing, because you know, if these two are perfectly aligned, the normal force and the, and the weight are perfectly aligned, then these two will cancel out. And if you take moments about the center of mass or the center of gravity, then you would just end up with this friction force here, and the guy would just fall straight over. Right? Because although the net force on the bike would be sufficient to cause an acceleration, there would also be a net moment on the bike, and that net moment would cause the person to have an angular acceleration, and they'd flip over. So, <coughs> <coughs> um, actually, yeah, we've just about run out of time. Okay, so I'll come back to this on uh, Monday, and we'll go through this problem on Monday rather than uh, get halfway through it now. So I'll see you all then.